let's, uh, uh, this evening we're, we're looking at the, once a month I'm going through this, and I can't wait till we can get into the language part, but how to interpret the Bible. And I'm just pulling out different facets, and this time we're going to look at the most repeated geographic spot in the Bible. So basically, Jerusalem's history, which I'm going to trace for you this evening, displays the elements of how God unfolded the drama of redemption. And you'll see what I mean as we look at this. But basically, we've been cycling through these. Uh, the idea of biblical geography is this, that everything happens somewhere. And when something happens in the Bible, you know, God notes it. But sometimes God repeatedly, repeatedly brings up a spot. And that's what we're, we're looking at. Basically, what the scriptures show us is Jerusalem is big to God. In fact, it's so big uh, that, that I decided to devote a whole night just to Jerusalem. Now, this is for, I know that some people, let's see, what colors do we have here? Um, there we go, the white. Um, this is what all of you recognize right there. That's the Dome of the Rock. I just uh, blotted it out, but that's where it is. Uh, that's the, uh, actually, that's not the high point. Al-Aqsa, right next to it, is the second holiest spot for Muslims on earth. Not the Dome of the Rock, that's tertiary, but Al-Aqsa right here is vital. But that's what most people recognize in Jerusalem, but what they don't realize is that Jerusalem is sitting on this spot, which you're going to learn a lot about tonight, Mount Moriah. And from the beginning, from the earliest moments in the book of Genesis, God is singling out one spot that he said, that's my spot. That is going to be the canvas upon which I draw the, the beautiful drama of redemption. Now, the way that, that Jerusalem is laid out, there's a western ridge, a central valley. You know the central valley, this area as the Hinnom Valley, the other valleys, the Kidron Valley, the Mount of Olives. We talked about that extensively over on the right. Uh, that's where Christ ascended, and that's where he's returning, and so the, the whole Mount of Olives area. Now, this is what, you know, it just looks like nothing uh, but Coming down from the temple mount in a tongue shape is what is called the ancient core. This area right here, that little blip of houses, is the city of David, as in David's capital. It's the city of Salem, as in where Melchizedek came. And it's from which the city of Jerusalem of Christ's time, and of course prior to that in the Old Testament, spread out upward from the ridge. But it starts right in that tongue. Now, what's fascinating for us to see is that Mount Moriah, which is, is the, the high point right there, is probably Mount Moriah isn't that exciting to us until we think about that the northernmost piece of Mount Moriah has two names in the Bible. One is Golgotha, and that rings a big bell of Christ's crucifixion, and the other is Calvary. And so the, the whole ridge that starts and goes up to the Mount Moriah is central to everything that God is talking to us about. Jerusalem is mentioned over 800 times, a lot more than 800, 814 plus called Zion 160 plus the city of David 46 times. But three huge events in Jerusalem. It was in Jerusalem that God promised Christ was coming because he said God is going to provide a lamb. And, and in that exchange in Genesis 22, it is not just that Isaac was spared because of the ram, but the idea that God would provide a lamb was speaking to Christ being the lamb of God. David was promised a future son that would have an endless kingdom in Jerusalem. That's the Davidic covenant, and Jesus is the son of David. And then in Jerusalem, God says, that is where I am going to accomplish. In fact, even in the Pentateuch, God says, someday when, as they were leaving Egypt, God says, you're going to a place that I've already chosen, and there you're going to see my redemption. And that was pointing the temple and then the cross, uh, pointing to what Christ did in his sacrifice, which was prefigured in all of the Mosaic regulations. Now, those three things, and just to give you a perspective, this little outline here 
is the outline of the old city of Jerusalem. That's just, I mean, if you go to Jerusalem, those are the walls. Uh, these walls were built uh, at, at approximately the same time as Martin Luther was nailing the theses in Wittenberg's church. In 1517, uh, the Suleiman the Magnificent was finishing up the walls going around this city. Uh, this, these gates basically um, are built atop, they were built in the 16th century, but they're built on top of the gates that were there from the time of Christ. And beneath those are the time of the Old Testament kings. And so all the way around, uh, this is what the ancient city looks like. You probably know this is the tinderbox. This is called the Temple Mount, this little uh, rectangular right here. There's the Dome of the Rock. This is El Aqsa right there that I told you is so vital. Now look in perspective to this, this dotted line is ending in the pool of Siloam. Do you remember Jesus went and sent the man that was uh, blind, put the mud in his eyes, sent him to the pool of Siloam. That is at the very southern tip of the city of David, which was part of Jerusalem in Christ's time. The modern walls don't encompass where Christ was. But this is the city of David and also the Jebusite city before David, and also Salem of Melchizedek in Genesis 14. So you see how it's that little tongue of land. That's the most ancient part, and that's the city that we're going to see a little bit later in Genesis 14 and 22. This is where in 1 Chronicles 21, when the, the plague was striking because David numbered the people and God sent a plague, it was at that time, a flat threshing floor of Ornan, uh, the Jebusite, and it was outside the city that David was living in, and they were threshing, and, and the prevailing winds were blowing the chaff away. But that later became the spot when David purchased it that Solomon built the temple right up here. But the ridge that starts here continues up to here. This is one from the top of the city of, uh, and if I can get a different color, there we go. This is one big ridge of rock that is called Moriah. And so Mount Moriah in Abraham's time, when he offered Isaac, most likely, and I'll show you an aerial of this, was the highest point. Right where that star is, is 777 meters high. This right here is only about 750 meters, so it's actually getting, it's climbing. So the very peak of Mount Moriah is where in Genesis 22, Abraham offered Isaac. Now there was no city at that time. This was just nothing. Uh, this was a, a place where they threshed their, their grain. This was the city that Melchizedek came out to greet Abraham. And so you can think of just, uh, you know, crops and everything and, and threshing floors. And Abraham comes up from Hebron, from the south, comes up and is building the altar at the top of Mount Moriah, which is the very same spot that we're going to look at in a moment when we open the scriptures that God had already chosen, which was going to be the most important event in the universe, and that's the crucifixion of Christ. So... Uh, so much in Jerusalem to look at. Uh, it says in 1 Kings eleven thirteen 13, that God says, I'm doing what I'm doing for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. And that's why Jerusalem is still vital. Uh, that's why it's in the news all the time. And, and really, the contest right now that's going on in Jerusalem is, uh, who is the true God? Is it Allah or is it Jehovah or Yahweh? And that is what's going to determine the end of human civilization, which is the real God. You know, right now, Allah, you know, numbers, you know, his adherents, 1.3 billion. Uh, the followers of Yahweh, as far as the Jewish people, number only 7 million. And they are, you know, against one another. And uh, it's all because God says, I have chosen and made my name staked on Jerusalem being for my chosen people promised the Jews. So it's, it's pretty climactic. This is a terrible picture. But this is from the city of David today. If you go through it, they've architecturally done a, um, an archaeological rendering of what the architecture was like. The Gihon Springs, the water source for uh, Jerusalem in David's time, and that central valley coming. But that was all the bigger it was in David's time. 
Uh, this, this is their drawing, and they've actually found all of this. These are the monumental uh, rampart buildup that holds the palace of David. Uh, Elat Matsar, uh, an archaeologist, found David's citadel. Uh, his house at the top of the city of David in Jerusalem. And they're just finding stuff all the time, but this is uh, uh, just amazing, the confirmation. So the reason why Jerusalem is so important is, I already showed you, God said, it's my city. For the last two weeks, we looked through Zechariah uh, when we read through Zechariah 12 through 14, and God said it's his clock. This evening, we're going to look at the last thing. It's God's canvas, because... Uh, I'll show you how much he teaches us. Another view of what the city of David looked like uh, in 1000 BC. Jerusalem just celebrated their 3000th anniversary. But now, as we go through the scriptures, and you can be starting to turn to, in your Bibles to Genesis 14, we're just going to have kind of a read through and, and note some things uh, about how vital Jerusalem is in God's plan. And basically, where we're headed is, and we certainly won't be able to read because these are very long passages, but Jerusalem is first mentioned in the Bible as the city of Melchizedek. Uh, Melech uh, is, is the word for king. Uh, Zadek is the word for righteousness. So it's king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. Uh, now, What's amazing is the name of the city, it isn't called Jerusalem, it's called the, this end of it, Salem, which is shalom, which is the word for peace. So what's fascinating is the first time we hit Jerusalem, it's called Salem, the city of peace, which has a king who is also a priest of the Most High God, who is called the king of righteousness. So we know something is going on that God introduces the city that way. Then the next time we see it, when we get to Genesis 22, it's the city that, that Abraham has to take his son walking up to. And Isaac is saying, um, we have the sticks, we have the fire, we have the knife, we have the altar. Where is the lamb? And that's where Abraham says, God will provide it, but if he doesn't, you're the sacrifice. And, and it was on that spot that God would offer his own son. Now, something interesting, and, and this is for you to think about, in the Bible, the law of first mention is, remember, the Bible is engineered. God, God wrote every book of this Bible. Yes, he used people, but he chose everything that's in it. Isn't it interesting that the first time, for example, the word grace appears, it's in the time of Noah in the flood, when God graciously, in Genesis 6 through 8, saves eight people. That is a picture of grace. It says in the Bible, in Genesis 6, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So grace is a big word in the Bible, but the first time it's there, it's in Genesis. Here's another big word in the Bible. Love. The first time love shows up in the Bible, it's right there. And it says that a father so loved his son. Abraham, as he walked to Moriah, went with the, he was a father that loved his son, but was taking him to Moriah to sacrifice him. So isn't it interesting that the first time love occurs in the Bible, it's a father loving his son, but willing to sacrifice him, which immediately, uh, makes us think of John 3, 16. For God, the Father, so loved his only begotten Son that he gave him as a sacrifice for us. So it's just, there's so many wonderful truths. It's also the city that God said, I want my temple built there. It became the city uh, when, and we probably will not get there, but these two passages are fascinating. In Ezekiel eleven twenty three, 23, we see the Shekinah and, and um, the Shekinah is the glory cloud. It's what hovered over the Ark of the Covenant. It's what at the launch of the tabernacle was the huge cloud that was so bright and awesome people couldn't even go in the tabernacle at the inauguration of it. It's the same glory cloud. It's kind of like a glowing light. 
that kind of embodies the presence of God that hovered over the temple and over the holy place as Solomon dedicated the temple. Well, that Shekinah glory was always in the Holy of Holies. It, there were no windows and there was no natural light, nor were there any lamps that were in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and the temple. It was lit by the Shekinah glory that hovered over the mercy seat. And that stayed there over the mercy seat until Ezekiel 11. And then it says it went up, the glory of God went up through the temple and it moved to the eastern gate. And it's almost like God looked back and then poof, it left. And that was when Israel was in apostasy, worshiping idols. And Ezekiel talks about it, and it's very graphic. But what you see is that glory cloud that goes up to God comes back down into another temple. Ezekiel's what is called the millennial temple. When the glory comes back and it fills that temple again in the topography, it's after the return of Christ. So that is fascinating in God's plan. It's also the city of the cross where Jesus was crucified. But this is what's so interesting. Jerusalem is also the heavenly city's name. And it's talked about in the book of Hebrews, so we'll look at all that. So let's begin uh, by going to the Genesis 14. That portion is where we are in the city of Melchizedek. Now, starting in verse 18, look at, look at what the Lord says. Then Mel now, what has happened is uh, Abraham, uh, you've all heard of, remember, well, no, I don't know if you have, but do you remember the Israelis rescued a group of their people in the airport in Africa called Enteb, or Entebbe, Enteb. And, and that's where Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the current president or premier of Israel, his brother was killed in that commando raid. So there's, there's a lot of uh, ethos and pathos going on with the current prime minister. But those Israelis were held in a hijacked airplane, and they were parked on a runway in, in Africa. And while the whole world wrung their hands, Israel sent three C-130s, and they landed in the dark. Their commandos got out, and they killed a terrorist and rescued all but three that perished in the process. Well, the same thing's going on 4,000 years ago. L look at what, what is going on in chapter 14 is that Abraham went after his hostage nephew taken by the, the hostile kings, Chedo Leomar was his name, and Abraham is, has such a big household, he has 318 trained commando soldiers that are his own servants. I mean, can you imagine having a household big enough that you could have 318 commando men who are your servants, let alone their wives and their children and the cooks and bottle washers and everybody else? I mean, Abraham was a mighty prosperous man. Well, he takes off with and divides his forces. See verse 15. Um, he hears that his, his uh, uh, brother is taken captive, his nephew Lot, verse 14 of chapter 14 of Genesis, and he armed his 318 trained, and the word servants is uh, implied, who were born in his own house. These were all homegrown, uh, his own army. He went and pursued as far as Dan. Uh, where Abraham lived was, uh, you know, the, the land of Israel looks like this, and there's the Sea of Galilee, has the Jordan River, and then the Dead Sea is like that. And Abraham lived down here in Hebron, uh, and Sodom and Gomorrah were somewhere down near, you know, they've been, Sodom and Gomorrah is, is variously referred to somewhere at the base of the Dead Sea, down around the bottom southern shore. He was living up on the plateau with all of his servants and his sheep. Dan is, uh, you know, Mount Hermon is here, and Dan is right next to it. Damascus is way over there. These people came from up there in Damascus, 30 miles from Mount Hermon. About a, two miles from Mount Hermon is Dan, the northernmost part of Israel. Here's the Sea of Galilee, so way up north of there. And so from Hebron going up here, is, you know, quite, I mean, a hundred and some miles. And Abraham, who is, you know, 80-some years old, takes his 318 servants and they go up there and they read what it says. It says that, that he attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. 
So they went way up here, you know, beyond Dan, 30 miles and beyond these 318, which these kings had come down. They'd snuck down this side of the rift. They'd, they'd pillaged and plundered all of the, the cities of the plain that were down here, and they had hauled them back up, and Abraham goes like that. And so that's an amazing accomplishment, uh, even probably greater than what Netanyahu's brother did. Look at verse 16. He brought back all the goods and brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. Verse 17, the king of Sodom, who did not go to battle, they stayed home licking their wounds, these kings from this area down here. And they went out to him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, as returned from the defeat of Chedorlaomer. Where, where are they coming? They came up like this, and Jerusalem is right here. This is the north part of the sea, the Dead Sea, and Jericho is right up here. So here's Jerusalem, this city. It's called Salem then, so it's Salem. And so Abraham is trotting down here with all the loot. He's, he has captured and, and all the stuff looted, all the prisoners, the, the captives, the children, all the treasure. He's carrying it back, and he gets to this Valley of the Kings around Jerusalem or Salem. And the kings were with him. Chedorlaomer in verse 17 comes up. Now here's the big point. Look at verse 18. And Melchizedek, remember Melech means king, Zadok means righteousness, the king of Salem, which means peace, brought out bread and wine. Now it's just coincidental, but what are, what are we using tonight? Bread, which portrays the body of Christ, and the grape juice, this, this was wine that, that portrays his blood. The king of righteousness, who is also the king of peace, brings out bread and wine and meets the friend of God. I mean, this is one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. And he was priest of the Most High God. There are, if you know anything about ancient history, kings and priests never mixed. Usually there was a priestly class in the king, and they were kind of checks and balances. This was a king who was a priest. It's very, what is Jesus? Jesus is a prophet, a priest, and a king. He's all three. And, and so this guy is, we'll find out later, is portraying Christ. And he blessed him, this king of Salem, right there. Blesses Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, El Elyon, uh, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tithe of all. By the way, what was Melchizedek? He was a king. He was a human. He was a person. He was a man. There's a lot of conjecture who he was, and we don't need to conjecture, but I'll tell you who was alive at this time. Shem was alive, Noah's son. Shem lived during the lifetime of Abraham. And, and so there are many thoughts about who this mysterious person was, but he wasn't an angel, and it, it's very, very unlikely that it was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. The Bible portrays him as the king of this town but he's God's man, he's a priest. And, and he gave him, that's Abraham, look at the end of verse 20, he gave him a tithe of all. You know what that means? You know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to be legalistic, I don't want to tithe. Tithing did not originate with Moses. It's not part of the law. It's pre-Mosaic. It, it, Abraham tithed to God. Isaac, Jacob tithed to God. So it's very interesting, this 10%, by the way, in the pagans, they gave 10% to their gods. Now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, verse 21, give me the persons, take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and I will take nothing, not a thread of your sandals. I should not take anything these years, lest you should say I made Abraham rich. Remember, Abraham is one of the wealthiest men of the area down here in this area around Hebron, where he lives by the oaks of Mamre and, and buried in the cave of Machpelah. And he says, I'm not taking any of your pagans' money. It reminds me of John Piper, the great uh, theologian and recent retired pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church, who said when someone in his church uh, won the lottery, he said, don't play the lottery for me. I'm not taking any of the money of paganism to help my church. He kind of was following Abraham's, that I'm not going to let the pagans enrich what God is doing. God is strong enough to bless Abraham, and Piper said he was strong enough to bless his church, which was quite a statement, because I think 
the person won 180 million in the lottery, you know, and they want to feel better and give 10% to the church. Now, verse 21, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, um, I mean, uh, verse 23, I have made Abraham rich. Now look at 24. Accept the young men, what they have eaten, and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. So basically what happens here is we meet this mysterious king of Salem. He blesses Abraham, and it's all over. Okay? That's all I wanted to say about him. Uh, now let me show you what's going on. This is where we are in Genesis 14. This is where Melchizedek was. This wasn't there. That's a threshing floor later. This is just a mountaintop. But now, so just think of this stretch. This is where Melchizedek was. This is where the threshing floor is going to be in David's time, a thousand years later. But now, let's turn to Genesis 22. And this is what, uh, just before we go to communion, I want to show you something fascinating because we're actually studying what we're celebrating tonight. In Genesis 22, we meet Abraham going to Moriah in chapter 22. And it came to pass, verse 1, after these things that God tested Abraham. By the way, he gives him 10 tests, and he fails four of them. He was only a 60% student, uh, Abraham was. And he said to him, Abram, or Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said to him, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you, and there's the first time that word is in the Bible. You see it there? Love. Whom you love. So there's a father who loved his son. Go to the land of Moriah. Now remember again, I showed you where Abraham lived down here, and, and he's going up north to Moriah. And this is, Moriah is where he had been eight chapters before. It's the ridge of mountains that Jerusalem is the southernmost tip, and it goes up. And I told you that this is 777 meters, and this spot is 750-some, and this drops precipitously down into a very deep valley. So he says, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early, and you know the story that Abraham goes obedient to God, builds a little altar on this mountain, this, this high point that is overlooking and looking down that God has so much planning in the future for. And up here, he builds that altar and he piles the rocks and puts the wood on, ties his son, places him on there. You can read the story. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of his burnt offering, laid Isaac his son, took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. And Isaac said, my father, here, here I am, my son. He says, look, the fire, the wood, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 7, where's the lamb? And you remember what John 1.29 says, Behold the Lamb of God. This is a prefiguring of the Lamb that's going to come there. Isaac is asking, where is the Lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a Lamb for a burnt offering. So they went together and they came to the place that God had told him. God directs him because this is going to be the place of Isaac's sacrifice and Christ's sacrifice. This is going to be the place of David's sacrifice to God and the building of the temple. And this is going to be the place where the son of David is the king and where, you know, the, the covenant is going to be made. This strip right here is prime real estate to God. This is very important. This is what is today Jerusalem. And so Abraham, uh, verse 9, built an altar, placed the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood, stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay him. In verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, don't lay your hand. And you know the story. God blessed him for his faith. And if you, you keep reading, in verse 13 it says, there was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. In verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, which has become one of the great names of God. As it is in this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Now think about that. In the mount of the Lord, the mountain the Lord picked for a father who so loved his son, he was willing to sacrifice him, 
look at this prophecy in verse 14. In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. For centuries what was provided was a place where people could come to worship God, but in the fullness of time, on the same spot, at the highest point, God sent Christ. And he was offered, and that's kind of jumping ahead, but the city of Moriah, here's the Temple Mount, there's the city of David, right here is Golgotha. These are the, the ge geological maps. Uh, and you can see the 740, 740, 750. This is the, this is the underlying ground of modern-day Jerusalem. This is where Arunah's offering was that David, or his uh, threshing floor where David built the, the uh, altar to the Lord and then Solomon put the temple there. But the highest point right there, 777 meters, which towers 100 feet plus over this area, is where Abraham uh, offered Isaac. And so in that mountain, what we see is the temple was built, and then they apostatized, and, and as I told you, the glory of the Lord left, and the glory of the Lord went out the eastern gate, the Shekinah, only to come back during the millennium. But then it became, and what we celebrate tonight, the city of the cross. So if in your Bibles you want to turn to Hebrews 13, what we're celebrating tonight is in Hebrews 13, what Jesus Christ did for us. And it says in verse 12 um, of Hebrews 13, a beautiful, beautiful reminder of, of what we're remembering tonight. It says, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. And uh, just, to, just to go back, if, if, you, if you think about this, here's the Damascus Gate. Uh, Jesus was over here was where he was scourged, and they gave him his cross, and he walked out the gate and went to that point that I showed you here that is 777 feet high. This right here is the outline of the city of Jerusalem. See that? Remember I told you that's the the walls that Suleiman built, you can see them right there. You know, I'll just scribble over them so you see the, the line, and they go down like this. Jesus walked from the Antonian fortress, carrying his cross out this gate, and was crucified somewhere near this peak. Now, most likely he wasn't on the very top because it was quarried away by Herod to build the temple of Christ's day. And so most often the Romans did not crucify people up on top of mountains. They crucified them down by the road. And right at the base of this was this gravel pit. And that's where they stoned and executed people. And most likely the Romans would have put crosses right along that pit. And then they, when they got them off the cross, they just threw them in the pit. And that's why Joseph Arimathea went and besought Pilate to give him the body so they wouldn't throw it in the pit so that it could be wrapped up, put in a grave, so that the whole world would see that the tomb was empty. So that's what we celebrate tonight. And basically what we're looking at in Hebrews 13 is the theme to prepare our hearts for tonight, where Jesus suffered outside the gate. Now look what it says in verse 13. Therefore, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 13, therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. For we here have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Now, you know what's really interesting if you're from a background, a liturgical background? What do they call communion? They call it the holy, what? Eucharist. Eucharisteo, the good praising. Now look back what it says here, that we might offer the sacrifice of praise, the true confession of who Christ is. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And that's what the Lord asks us to do, and that's what communion is all about. So it's time for us to transition into communion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you just to take a moment before the Apostle Paul said Jesus told him that before the early church was to celebrate communion, they were to prepare.
And what we're going to do is prepare our hearts and making sure there's no unconfessed, unforsaken sin that we ask the Lord to cleanse us. So let's just take a moment, bow before the Lord, just bow your head before him and, and ask him to reveal if there's any sin that, that we are looking on with desire and say, Lord, I want to repent of that. I want to forsake that. I want you to cleanse me. I want to judge myself lest I be judged. I want your righteousness to be my desire. So cleanse me. And it's kind of like washing our hands before the meal. So as the, the elders and deacons are going to prepare to serve us, let's just take a quiet moment and prepare our hearts and make sure there's no unconfessed, unforsaken sin. In just a moment, I'll pray. Oh, Father, I thank you that you so loved the world that you sent your son. But you didn't just send him to be a, a beautiful child born and a perfect life lived. You sent him to become sin and to suffer, as Hebrews 13 says, suffer outside the gate for us. And then you said that we should go outside the gate for him, bearing his reproach. And it seems like every day, the world is more hostile to the truth of your word, to the, the uniqueness that you are, O Christ, as God in human flesh. In fact, people share the gospel these days without even mentioning your name because you're so offensive. And how can it be the gospel when the gospel is that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? And so we worship you. We Eucharisteo you tonight. We bless and praise and rejoice that you went to the spot where Abraham and Isaac prefigured a father's love of his son and his sacrifice. And on that spot, you bore our sin. And I pray that we would say, what a Savior you are tonight and worship you. Thank you for the bread. And as we take this bread and hold it in our hands, may we offer to you what Hebrews 13 says you want, and that is the sacrifice of our praise to your name as the offering to you. Thank you for letting us worship you tonight. In the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. You've been sitting so long. As the men come to pass the bread, let's all stand, okay? And we'll stand and sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior to Christ tonight. Remember, Hebrews 13 says that we should offer the sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Use the words of this hymn to be a, a gift to him tonight. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When we get to the end, we'll do the hallelujahs over and over, but let's do this stanza. Guilty, vile, and Helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he, full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high, 
Hallelujah. What a Savior. Last stanza, we'll do three hallelujahs. Here we go. When he comes, a glorious king, all his ransom home to bring. Then anew this song we'll sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Savior. A mm, little bit like the throne we're going to stand around. We're holding that bread in our hands, reminding us that Jesus Christ gave himself for me. Now, this doesn't save us, but by partaking of this, we're saying, I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, who is my sacrifice. And this is a picture that I'm trusting in him. Jesus said, This is my body which was given for you. Do this, remembering me. Let's partake together. Dear Father, we thank you that Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress, amidst flaming worlds by these arrayed, with joy I'll lift up my head. The only reason we'll be able to lift our heads in the presence of a holy God in heaven is because you, Lord Jesus, have taken the penalty, the punishment. You've taken the, the horrors of our sin upon yourself, and you've removed even the record that we have sinned. That's how wonderful justification is. And forever we'll thank you. And I pray that tonight, through this cup, we will begin that process of rejoicing in our full, complete, and once and for all finished salvation. Thank you for this cup. Bless us as we worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As the men pass the cup to us, we're going to sing Count Zinzendorf's great hymn about Christ. Let's sing it to the Lord. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds in these arrayed with joy, shall I lift up my hand? Bold shall I stand in thy great day, for who hot to my charge shall lay, fully absolved through these I am from sin and fear from guilt and shame. Lord, I believe thy precious blood, which at the mercy seat of God forever doth for sinners plead for me, in for my soul was shed. Lord, I believe we're sinners more than sands upon the ocean shore. Thou hast for all a ransom paid for all, a full atonement made. And if you believe that's true, say amen. You know, Zinzendorf founded the Moravian Brethren, which went out from Central Europe to evangelize widely across the world. And it was Moravian Brethren riding on a little boat from, from Europe over to Georgia where Wesley and Whitfield were going to serve the, the Church of England. 
and scared to death they were on that boat in a storm, the Moravian brethren were ready to die and were sharing the gospel. And through Zinzendorf's missionaries, they led the Wesleys to the Lord. And Whitfield uh, followed Christ, and it started one of the most amazing 18th century uh, spreadings of the gospel. So, I mean, that, that's a strange hymn to sing, that, oh, oh, oh. but it's powerful message, and, and it just reminds me of what we're doing tonight. We are proclaiming that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sins. And if that's happened to us, if we by faith have partaken of Christ, he said, come to my table and drink this cup, remembering me. So Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant that's in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink, remembering me. Let's partake together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for letting us gather. Thank you for repeating Jerusalem hundreds of times so we get the message. You did some great things there. That's where you ascended back to the Father. That's where you're coming back to set things straight. That's where you paid for our sins. And all we have to say is, hallelujah, what a Savior you are. Thanks for letting us gather. May we live as your children. In the name of Jesus and by your grace by which we've been saved, may we walk in that precious name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.